Welcome to the Bookman's Corner. I'm your host, Lois Lindstrom. We have a great show today about a book that tells the astonishing story of the Berlin Tunnel, one of the greatest espionage operations of the Cold War between the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, and the Soviet mole who betrayed it. The book is Betrayal in Berlin, the true story of the Cold War's most audacious espionage operation. It was written by our guest author, Steve Vogel. Steve, so glad you're here. Glad to be here. Steve is a veteran journalist who worked for the Washington Post for more than two decades and has written two well-received books. In Betrayal in Berlin, Steve Vogel reveals the full story of Operation Gold, a daring plan to dig a 1,500-foot clandestine tunnel beneath patrolling East German troops. If successful, the Americans and British would tap into critical KGB and Soviet military underground telecommunication lines, providing access to a vast treasure of intelligence. Yet as the Allies were silently digging their tunnel, a traitor, George Blake, codenamed Agent Diamond, was also digging for dirt, and he was perhaps the most damaging mole of the Cold War. Steve loved your book, fantastic, exciting spy stories. Uh, what, what inspired you to write this? Well, I just felt like I had a lot of connections with Cold War Berlin. Um, my dad was actually stationed there during uh, the Cold War at the, the end of the, the tunnel's life. Um, like in the mid-50s then, right? Right, in yeah. the mid, mid-50s, exactly, and then uh, into the early 60s. And I was actually born in, in Berlin in 1960 mm. when my, my dad was stationed there. So um, I'd always felt this connection to, to start with, and then... Um, I'd studied German in school and uh, ended up going back to Germany as a reporter mm -hmm. and was there in uh, 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down. Oh, how, what an incredible time to be there. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was just, uh, it's hard to believe now. It's, it's been 30 years since that happened. But <laughs> you must have been filing stories constantly, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, you know, it was amazing. I'd only uh, intended to stay in Germany for a few months mm -hmm. just as a freelancer, mm -hmm. but ended up staying for five years and you know, covered a lot of the uh, remarkable stories that accompanied the end of the Cold War, the, you know, including then the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. And, yes, uh, yes, a lot of huge changes. Exactly. Well, uh, let's, let, let's, let's talk about your dad. Did you know that he was working for the CIA when you were a kid? I mean, no did, idea. No you idea. You had no idea. What did, what did you think he did? Well, I thought he was uh, in the State Department. That was mm. his cover. He was a political officer, and, you know, we had been in Mexico and Argentina. And, and you had siblings. And you had siblings, right? Right. Yeah. I had, yeah, uh, two older brothers and a sister. Wow. So, and so then you learned. When did you learn that he was working for the agency? Um, it was when I was a either a junior or senior in, in high school, and I remember I would, you know, was just talking one one day at dinner about just complaining about the CIA and all this these things that they'd been doing in Chile that had come out, and I was going on about the, that and. My parents said, well, there's something we should tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like, you should know that your, your dad is... <laughs> right. So I was like, oh, really? That's really cool. I mean, yeah, that, so. uh, that's amazing. Well, <clears throat> when, when the Soviets revealed the spy tunnel in Berlin to the public with great fanfare in April 1956, they expected it to be a huge embarrassment to the Americans, and instead it was hailed as a great success for the CIA. I mean, can you tell us more? Yeah, that was one of the great ironies of, of this whole thing. There, there are a lot of ironies, but uh, uh, both sides kind of miscalculated uh, what, what the end result would be in many ways. But yeah, the, the Soviets um, decided that they were going to use the, this tunnel as a way of embarrassing the Americans, you know, that they were engaged in this um, back, backhanded type um, espionage operation in, in Berlin and that they should be thrown out for it. But Instead, uh, the, the reaction around the world was, wow, the, the CIA actually pulled a fast one on, on the Soviets. <laughs> did something, that's right. Because, you know, the KGB had this, you know, image, uh, and rightly so, as, as being this extremely effective intelligence organization. And, mm -hmm. and the CIA at that point hadn't It was, it was second rated, oh, I guess. Yeah, 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 they were relatively new. They'd only mm -hmm. uh, been around for less than a decade at mm -hmm. that point. And, you know, the KGB was definitely, the, they were the big boys on the block. Whoa. Well, it was fascinating to read that while many thought the, um, that the tunnel was not a valuable asset, declassified papers now tell us that intelligence from the tunnel was genuine and important to the United States. Can you tell us more? Right. Well, when, uh, when it was eventually learned much later that uh, George Blake had betrayed the tunnel, the common um, 
reaction at that point became, well, then all, all the information in the tunnel must have been fake, mm -hmm. you know, fake news, fake, you know, disinformation yeah, yeah, right. and, and all this. And, um, but really, as, a, as I've been digging into it and interviewing uh, uh, a lot of the participants who were still living at the time um, and, uh, you know, just analyzing the information that they had, uh, it, it's become quite clear that really the, the, the vast amount of information they, they received was very important. And for, accurate. And accurate. Oh, it, was, it was all essentially well, accurate. Incredible, incredible. Yeah. Well, arguably, the most uh, intriguing subject in your book is, is George Blake, the dangerous Soviet mole who betrayed the operation. Uh, I, I just found your stories about George Blake so compelling. Uh, because he was such a spy. He, he started off in North Korea. <laughs> um, can, well, can you tell us, uh, give us a brief history of George and his impact on the operation? Tell us his, his early history. Yeah, I mean, he'd already led a, an amazing life even before he got to North Korea. I mean, all kinds of uh, espionage and uh, daring do. He, he was born. He was, like a, he was like a James Bond, wasn't he, in a way? <laughs> in a way. Um, you know, he was um, very mild mannered. Mm -hmm. um, not, uh, but uh, his um, his father was a, a, a Turkish subject who fought for the British Army in World War One. Mm -hmm. Had at the end of World War One had been sent to Holland and met a, a Dutch woman, and they married, and their child was was George, named after King George of, of England, and, <laughs> and um, uh, young George Blake. Uh, his father died uh, when he was quite young, and uh, he was sent to Egypt to live with wealthy relatives who could see to his schooling. So he lived this fantastic life for a few years in, mm -hmm. in Cairo, living on this island in the Nile, you know, sir, with you know, fancy servants, um, and um, you know, kind of this, this double life that he was going through already. He'd go back to Holland um, on the summer vacations, and he was there when uh, World War II broke out, and he was kept there, mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the Nazis invaded Holland, and Blake ended up going underground and working as a schoolboy courier for the Dutch resistance, you know, mm -hmm. peddling around, mm -hmm. bringing mm -hmm. messages back and forth, and then uh, escaping across Europe when he feared arrest and, you know, across the, uh, the snowy Pyrenees Mountains, making his way to England. And um, they're so impressed by him that they, the uh, British Secret Intelligence Service recruits him. And he knows so many languages. He knows like three or four languages yeah. fluently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he does at, at this point. Uh, Obviously, uh, uh, Dutch and, and English and French and, and Russian, uh, right? He's, he he eventually uh, will, will learn, learn Russian, Russian at yeah, this point, yeah. not yet, but um, yeah. So he's very useful, and he, he's already had a, a life of kind of on double, you know, double life on the ro uh, on the road, and quite accomplished. It, 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 well, it was just amazing that um, I, I found it astonishing that you traveled to Russia to interview George Blake who is now uh, 96 years old, living in Russia. Uh, tell us about that interview attempt for your book. Well, um, you know, I've worked as a reporter um, most of my life, and including here in Arlington, by the way. I was, uh, you know, with the, the journal newspapers oh, in, in cool. Northern Virginia for a number of years. So I used to cover Arlington Courthouse and the, the county uh, build uh, executive and all that. But um, so, I mean, as a reporter, my instinct is, you know, you don't ask permission to, to talk to someone, you just do it. You just do it. Yeah. So um, I had various contacts um, that I was trying to see if somebody could get me a phone number for George Blake, because he was living in a dacha outside of, of Moscow. And um, now what year was this? Did you do that? That would have been 2015, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I eventually did get a, a phone number for him, and I just called him out of the blue. Uh, just figured, try my luck. And you know, his his wife answered, and she put me on the phone. Uh, I just, hello, I'm, I'm, you know, introduced myself, and I'm I'm writing a, a book about the Berlin Tunnel. And I speak to Mr. Blake, and so yeah, he's right here, George. And uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, so he was, he, you know, he was polite. Um, now, did you did you go to the and you did you go to the the Dhaka and did you take pictures? Did you? Yeah. So what happened was uh, we had a, a good conversation then, but not a very long one. And I I wanted to I had to do a lot of research in Europe, mm -hmm. in both in Germany, mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom, which was involved in this tunnel operation, mm -hmm. and interviews in France. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to go to Moscow to see if I could meet Blake in person. And again. Um, I decided, you know, probably if I went, you know, tried to set something up, he'd probably say no because, mm -hmm. you know, he's um, 
it was not something he particularly would want to do. Right, so I, right. Uh, he, and he, he's up, up there in age. He's yeah. up there in age. Um, but uh, I, I got directions to his dacha, um, which were very, you know, I didn't have an address. It was, it was one of these things, we'll take this train down to this village and you'll see various fields. gravel <laughs> roads yeah, and fields and, and walk on the third road on the right and you'll cross a couple of trails and then they'll see some pine trees. And well, you should have had a film crew with you. That would have been a great <laughs> documentary right there. I did take some photos, but yeah, and I, I brought um, the uh, uh, translator who worked with the Washington Post with mm. me because I didn't speak Russian. Right, right, and right. Um, we were asking people, um, do you know where George Blake lives? And uh, a lot of KGB officers, retired officers, live down there and they were just saying, uh, no, no idea. Never heard of him. <laughs> right, that's right. And we were just walking away from this one gentleman who'd said no. And then he called after us. He said, "But you might want to check the third door on the left there." <laughs> yeah, that's right. There, that, that was the other. Well, I thought you know your book starts off with an incredible uh, the prologue about uh, uh, George Blake in North Korea, and of course this this huge horrendous march of, of the prisoners, the prisoners of war in North Korea. And it's it's shocking how terrible it is. I mean, it's, it's, to me, to me, it's amazing that he lived through that march. I mean, most people were dropping like flies; they were all dying. Well, tell our viewers about that march. Yeah, I mean, it's we, we often forget about how horrific the Korean War was in general, and particularly during that that first year, uh, Blake had been taken prisoner. And that was like 1950. 1950. 1950. Yep, yep. The, uh, the North Koreans had invaded in uh, the end of June, and uh, Blake was there as a uh, as a diplomat, supposedly a you know political officer for the, uh, for the, the British. British, although he was actually the chief of, of the intelligence station there for the British. He was taken prisoner along with other diplomats, journalists, and also a large contingent of American GIs who had been overrun um, by the North Korean army. And they were kept in horrific, uh, horrific conditions. Horrific, it was just shocking to read this. I mean, I almost couldn't turn the page. I was like, oh my God, another one, <laughs> another one bites the dust. And it was like, they were dying all over the place. Yeah, it no, was, it was really uh, oh something. And uh, the, the they weren't prepared for the, the incredibly brutal, cold weather. Brutal wet weather, and no, and they had no coats and no shoes, right. and nothing. It's right, just and they were being marched north. The, yeah. the Koreans, uh, North Koreans are trying to get them further mm. away from the, the uh, front line, um, and but, uh, but now, but, but from that experience is when George decides he's going to work for the Russians because he, he, he that was his out from 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 North Korea, right? That's right. Well, it, it was um, he was held there for three years. Now conditions improved after the first year of heavy fighting for the uh, the captives, and it was during that time, several two years there of uh, reflections that. Mm -hmm. He, by his account, um, became um, disenchanted with the enormous bombing that the Western, the British, and the Americans were were putting on North Korea. I mean, they were just pulverizing these villages, and you know he'd already had some tendencies um, from his experiences in Cairo when seeing the the great differences in wealth between the, the, rich the wealthy, and the, poor, yeah, yeah. the haves and the have-nots. Um, so I think he kind of um, was starting to think, you know. He's very he idealistic. He's yeah. ide idealistic yeah. and also naive yes, and um, yeah. malleable. Yes. And so, you know, by his account, he was the one who started the ball rolling. It could be that the KGB spotted him as someone that they could turn. Mm -hmm. So, and they did, right? I mean, yeah, they did turn it. The, the net result is he definitely turned. He definitely turned. Um, well, so what do you think made George Blake so dangerous to the Americans during the building of this tunnel in Berlin? What? Well, what made him so dangerous was that he knew about it. And the people who knew about it, you could count, you know, essentially on one hand, two at the most at that point, because this it was kept really secret, incredibly yeah. secret, um, because um, it, it was going to be such a sensitive operation mm -hmm. that um, they, you know, if word of it started getting around, it, the, it would be blown before it even started. So when Blake comes back from North Korea, he's given this hero's welcome uh, in Russia. Well, no, no, no it, it, actually in England. Yeah, he, in England. yeah, they, 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 uh, they, he, they come through Russia because they take the train. Yeah. But before long, he's back in England, gets a hero's welcome there. Yes. And um, he's, he's assigned to this very sensitive position in, in MI6, uh, mm -hmm. the British intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's right. Where he um, it becomes one of two or three people in British intelligence who know about the plans for this tunnel. So it's, uh, this makes him dangerous, of course, to the tunnel. But... This knowledge also makes it 
dangerous for the Soviets because since so few people know about it, um, if they do anything to stop this tunnel, it, they're, they're going to blow their new spy, George Blake, out of the water because it won't take long at That's all. That's right, to figure out who, who's telling, who knows about this. Right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, well, there were some, so many interesting characters in your book, like Bill Harvey, the CIA um, base chief in Berlin, is another memorable figure. Um, please tell our viewers how CIA legend Bill Harvey was described by fellow journalists and describe his personality. Well, you know, yeah, he was one of a kind. Actually, my, my dad. Um, worked for him um, in Berlin and my mom has <laughs> stories too. I mean he was uh, he was kind of a you know FBI G-man type. Um, he had a J James Bond tendency in that he drank a lot of martinis um, but he didn't look anything like James Bond. He was just he, kind of this very really stout. He's very, very stout. stout. Yeah. You know he had a crew cut and um, he um, you know was very profane. He, uh, he cussed he didn't a lot right? He cussed a lot. Yeah, yeah he, he didn't you know, in those days, uh, CIA officers kind of had this image of, of being somewhat genteel, you know, Eastern establishment, right. blue blood and all that, and that, that wasn't Bill Harvey. But he was a phenomenal expert on Soviet intelligence. He'd worked for the FBI. He'd become one of their, their lead uh, agents mm -hmm. in tracking Nazi intelligence rings uh, during World War II and then became the expert on, on Soviet mm -hmm. intel, you know, mm -hmm. attempts to spy in the United States. So, and, he, and he's a real workaholic, isn't he? A real workaholic, real workaholic. Yeah. Oh. yeah, very determined man. And um, so um, I also thought there were some other interesting people in this tunnel operation that you interviewed for the book. Um, there was a uh, the British SIS officer, Peter Montagnon? Mont yeah, Montagnon, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he knew Blake well, and... And who and you visited him in Provence for this book, right? Didn't you? Yeah, he was a remarkable source of information. I mean, he, very, very elegant man. I mean, he was later involved in the um, creation of the of the famous BBC Civilization series with Sir Kenneth Clark. So he's one of their top spies, right? Um, I wouldn't call him one of their top spies, but he was very useful communications guy, and he okay. was uh, an expert in tapping and those sorts of operations. And the British had done a tapping operation. Uh, in, Ven uh, in Vienna that mm -hmm. was, was quite effective. And um, Peter Montagnon uh, thus is brought in on this Berlin and operation. Course, and of course there, there was a tunnel in Vienna, right? They, they, there were several small, small tunnels, tunnels that were, in, in that were uh, put into the use. And, mm -hmm. the, and these had been quite effective at uh, getting intelligence mm -hmm. about the Red Army, mm -hmm. which of course had a huge force remaining in, in Eastern Europe at this time. And then there's, there's this uh, gentleman, Keith, um, Comstock, who was one of the Army Corps of Engineer officers who dug the tunnel. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think about the people like Keith, who who is now in his 80s, who and, and they they are now willing to speak about the tunnel for the first time. I mean, it's it was uh, yeah, it was really cathartic for uh, for Keith uh, because um, you know he'd had to. He, he was an Army Corps of en Engineers officer, and he had to go. He was recruited for this operation. You know, couldn't tell his family anything about it. You know, they didn't know where he was, and it caused a lot of strains back at home. Sure. Um, and, you know, even 20 years, 30 years later, he, you know, because the operation was still classified, mm -hmm. he, he couldn't speak about it. Um, finally, he learned it was declassified. So, you know, when I uh, reached him in, in uh, Tennessee and went out to visit him, I mean, he, he just had this flood of information. Because, yeah. I mean, he remembered it like well, it was yesterday. Yeah, this is right. Well, this, is, this book is filled with such great detail. I mean, I, know, I think the question I have for you is, why do you think stories from the Cold War remain so interesting to today's readers? Um, you know, in some ways it's because the, the Cold War hasn't ended in a way, right? I mean, we seem to be in, in sort of a core, Cold War now. I mean, just the, the general um, like, strain of relations with, with Russia um, is, is something, we, you know, we had a brief moment of bliss uh, at the end of the Cold War, but uh, that doesn't seem to be around these days. And uh, the other thing is, I mean, the Cold War was such a high stakes game. Um, because people really were concerned about the nuclear war happening. Absolutely, and that, that was the whole thing about the tunnel. Yeah. That's why Eisenhower, who was president at the time, was desperate for information, information um, because the Soviets had this enormous um, presence in, in um, Eastern Europe. They had also developed the nuclear bomb by this point. So mm -hmm. he, he was fearful that there could be another Pearl Harbor, except this time it would be a nuclear Pearl Harbor. Yeah, it would be that, That's what the tunnel was, was built to, to try to answer. Is there any information you were hoping to re to reveal that's still being kept secret about this tunnel in Berlin? Right. Well, um, you know, the the Russians have 
largely closed their archives to, to researchers now. So they had. there was a brief period there um, uh, at the end of the Cold War, mm -hmm. there was kind of that, that honeymoon period mm -hmm. um, where uh, they'd opened up the, the, uh, some of the intelligence that the, the Soviet, uh, that Russian intelligence held. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a CIA officer, Dave Murphy, um, who worked on a book about the intelligence war in Berlin, and he and his uh, Soviet counterpart, a mm -hmm. former KGB officer mm -hmm. uh, who handled George Blake, were able to get a fair amount of documents at that point. But once uh, Putin came to power, Things stopped. Things right? pretty much Close evaporated down. almost, it's you know, right. overnight. And, 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 yeah. there wasn't so much I'm sure there. there's more more secrets out there. Um, well, how difficult was it for the CIA to build a team of men who became known as the U.S. Army Tunnel Team, and how many men were members of the team to get this job done to build this tunnel? Well, it was severely compartmentalized. So, you had um, you you brought in the the Corps of Engineers. Uh, team mm -hmm. to, to actually dig it and mm -hmm. they you know they trained for this for six months you know out in New Mexico and elsewhere and they didn't know where they were going to the last minute um, okay. they, they didn't know you know they knew they were going to dig a tunnel it had to be in secret but they didn't know where <laughs> and they had to do, and they had to be very quiet and digging oh, yeah because right. they're they're doing it largely into Soviet held territory there Incredible. Uh, so it was going to be hand dug, um, hand dug. Mm -hmm. and then you know within the CIA um, the number of people that were involved was very low. So Bill Harvey, very secretive guy. I mean, he didn't tell his deputy about the tunnel Ooh. in Berlin. Nobody at the Berlin station, the ba Berlin base, knew about it except for two or three people. Um, That's incredible. Yeah. That is incredible. Well, now, how, describe how the Americans and Brits came together to build the tunnel because they both had the idea about the same time, but how did they split the responsibility for building the tunnel? Because the Brits were involved too, right? Yeah, oh, very much so. The, I mean, the Brits had pulled off the Vienna operation, okay. which, which was great, but it was much more, that was much smaller scale operation. Plus, they didn't have to dig in mm -hmm. enemy territory because the, mm -hmm. the Soviet uh, communication cables came through the uh, western controlled portions of, of Vienna. Okay. In, in, in Berlin, they're going to have to dig into the, the Soviet-held um, territory. So basically, the British had the expertise. They'd done it. Mm -hmm. um, but the Americans had the resources, the money. Um, you know, they had the Corps of Engineers. Um, Great Britain was in pretty poor, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. desperate straits after World War II. They're having all kinds that's of economic, economic problems. Issues, yeah, that's right. So the Americans had, you know, they, they had the money. They could get the Corps of Engineers to dig it, and, and the the Brits had the the expertise. So it, it made a lot of sense to team up. Yes, yes, and it was it was interesting to read that everything that would be needed to build the tunnel in Berlin was shipped to Fort Lee near Richmond, Virginia. I mean, how do they keep this a secret from the soldiers at Fort Lee? They um, they basically um, you know talked to the quartermaster corps which controlled Fort Lee at mm -hmm. the time and and uh, basically removed all their soldiers from this one warehouse and only the the tunnel team soldiers who had you know been cleared on for secret uh, clearance they were the ones who who packed everything up so you know they they kind of created packed their own little out, secret right? zone there Ooh. at Fort Lee and, and they put it you know uh, basically eventually aboard, aboard a um, uh, transport ship to take it across uh, to West Germany. Mm -mm -mm. Well, now who reveals Blake's treachery and how did the Western intelligence react when it learned that the KGB had known about the Berlin Tunnel from the beginning? I mean, also, uh, what was the what was the reaction? Well, um, it was uh, in 1960, um, this Polish uh, defector uh, someone who's very high in Polish intelligence began. And he he worked he worked for the Soviet Union, right? Or he he worked with the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. The the Poles had their own intelligence mm -hmm. service. Okay, okay. So, but he often um, was a liaison with with the KGB, mm -hmm. and he started delivering information to the Americans, um, and warning them that there was a a mole in in British intelligence, and um, the Americans shared this information with the British. It took a while because, mm -hmm. you know, George Blake was considered, uh, you know, above uh, suspicion. Yes, yes. But eventually it, it, it pointed to Blake. Um, and, you know, as I described in the book, there's a very delicate operation to lure him back from uh, Beirut where he was studying Arabic at the time to, uh, so they could arrest him. Um, and it, it takes, it's not immediately, I mean, after they, they uh, uh, interview him, he, he, he acknowledges pretty early on that, you know, he had betrayed the tunnel and yeah. that, 
They, and of course, and he's portrayed a lot of men who were killed, right? I mean, a lot of. Uh, that's that's what we suspect. Yeah. It, yeah. It, but th what's amazing is that George Blake escapes from prison in England. That, yeah, that's, that's just that's amazing. That's incredible. How did five he years do later. That? How did he do that? Because he was he was he was convicted. What was was it? Thirty five years in prison. Forty two. Like, yeah. Forty two. Or something. And he gets out. I mean, he it, it, he it's like uh, something out of out of a film. It, it, how did he, how did he do it? You know, he, um, he has this remarkable personality. Um, he's very, I guess, ingratiating. You, you could say he makes friends easily. You know, mm -hmm. he's kind of a, mm -hmm. um, and he, he was in prison and he expected everybody to hate him for being a traitor. But he, he was always the guy that was willing to help the other, you know, prisoners, help them translate documents, help them write <laughs> letters to their lawyer. You know, he's kind of like a listening board. He would sit there and, and listen for hours. So he made a lot of friends. Okay. And, you know, some of the f his fellow prisoners began to see him as a political prisoner because um, while they didn't necessarily approve of his espionage, mm -hmm. he was given a sentence that was far higher than anyone else in British history. Okay. Um, be because very of, harsh. Yeah, yeah because he, he couldn't get the death penalty mm -hmm. for, for that penalty, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Secrets Act th that he violated. But so he, they'd given him three consecutive sentences on that. So. He just built up a lot of sympathy and, and, and was able to persuade some people to help him on the inside. It's, it's amazing that, that, that he escaped and, and, and then went on to, 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 to Russia. I mean, yeah, I mean, that whole adventure. This, an incredible, another adventure. And, and then you wrote in Chapter 15 that uh, when they were building the, this tunnel, there were 10,000 intelligence operators working in Berlin in 1955. 10,000 people yeah. working Ber in intelligence? That's incredible. Berlin was the espionage capital of the world before the wall was built because, <laughs> because that was what, what made Berlin so unique. You had the four major powers there, the, the Brits, the Americans, the French, and the Soviets. But there was free access between the sectors, so you know people could ride the sub, you know the U-Bahn back and forth just as easily as we could go from Roslyn to Dupont Circle or something. And 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 it's just um, so Blake and others and met, many intelligence operatives were able to to move back and forth. They, they could deliver information to the West and then take the subway back. And it, that's, that's right. How could you keep track of so many people? That's right. It's, right. It was amazing. It was amazing. Well, I tell you, it's been amazing. To read this book, and I really um, am so appreciative that you came to our studio in Arlington to tell us more about it. And and where can our viewers find your book if they would like to buy it? Well, it's at on all, all major sites. You know, Amazon. It's at Barnes and Noble stores, independent bookstores everywhere. Um, you can also get information at my uh, website, uh, www.stevevogelsite.com. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Lois. And please join us again next time for a new edition of the Bookman's Corner. I'm Lois Lindstrom.